If you would, could you please turn in your Bibles to the book of John? We're reading out of chapter 15, verses 1 through 17. This will be on page 848 in the Bibles in front of you. Hear the word of the Lord. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is, the com- this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. My name is Marilyn, and I'm an elder, part of the leadership here at CCC. So if you're not already still there, let's go back to John 15. Remember, that's page 848 in the, in the Black Bibles. Um, if you do not have a Bible of your own, that Bible that you just picked up is yours. Or, better yet, come out to the welcome desk afterwards. We have a Bible for you. So I chose to speak about this part of John 15 because I wanted to know what abide in Christ means and what it doesn't mean. So to abide is to obey by bearing the fruit of love for one another. Now at the risk of sounding like Sophia from the Golden Girls, picture it, Jerusalem somewhere around 30 to 33 AD. Jesus and his disciples are gathered for Passover. But this is the final evening that Jesus has with his disciples before his arrest, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. Imagine at the end of your life the, the importance, the need to tell your loved ones the very most important things that you have for them. Each word and each, each thought needs to be impressed upon them in the time remaining. It is precious time. Throughout this passage, we hear Jesus' words of reassurance and his hope to his disciples. In these verses, he is very intentional about describing the intimate and unending connection that he has with them and that they have with each other. Lord, we come to you in in all kind of various states with burdens, 
with successes, with distractions, with questions, with confusion, with fear, with joy. Lord, Holy Spirit, cause those distractions, cause those things to fall away and help us focus on what you have for us. God, impress upon us the message that you have for us through the words of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. So at this point in the evening, Jesus has already washed the feet of the disciples. He has instructed them about communion. Jesus has already departed the room to go betray him. Jesus has foretold Peter's denial of him, and he has promised to send the Holy Spirit. By the way, a common technique in John's writings is that he loops back in order to move forward. So we'll be doing some of the same thing in this. He starts with a pretty common metaphor that was very familiar to the disciples of the vine and the branches in verses 1 to 6, and then he goes back and he sort of expands on those in verses 7 to 11. This same metaphor of the vine and branches is used a number of times in the Old Testament. But in the Old Testament, the vine is always Israel. But Israel could not produce good fruit on the branches. They continually produce sour, wild, bad fruit. Literally, they could not produce good fruit to save them. We cannot produce good fruit either on our own. Jesus has already told his disciples that the time has come for him to leave them and to return to his Father. They are confused. They are grieving. They are scared. Jesus starts this metaphor on a very important evening by saying, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. The father is the gardener or the farmer who plants the vine, which is Jesus. God is also the one who continues to tend the vine. In contrast to the vine in the Old Testament, Jesus is now the true vine, the perfect, genuine thing. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So let me address that first part of that. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So is the branch taken away because it does not bear fruit? No. The lack of fruit is the evidence that of not being actually a disciple of Jesus. So this person, this branch is the person who only gives the appearance, maybe, of following Jesus. Um, in other words, he or she may be in church, maybe outwardly say all the, what sounds like the right things, but in reality, he or she only believes that part of the gospel they find easy or convenient while at the same time really believing that they can rely on something else to save them or that they don't really need saving at all. So we have to come to more than a surface, partial belief in the gospel that, that, that it's true. We must come to a place of heart-changing, life-changing acceptance. The gospel calls us to both faith and repentance. Um, in our transfer to the EPC, we've been reading and studying the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is accompanied by the Westminster Shorter and Larger Catechisms. So confessions are documents that sort of summarize what we believe about Scripture and about God and so forth, and they're written as statements. Catechisms... Uh, do the same thing, but they're written as a question and answer format. So the Westminster Shorter Catechism, uh, questions 86 and 87, I think are helpful here. Question 86 is, what is faith in Jesus Christ? 
Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. Then question 87 says, what is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is a saving grace by which a sinner being truly aware of his sinfulness understands the mercy of God in Christ grieves for and hates his sins, turns from them to God, fully intending and striving for a new obedience. So both faith and repentance are saving graces given to us by the Holy Spirit. Yet we have a responsibility in this to accept. The sovereignty of God frees our will to be able to accept. The act of God enables the human act of coming to him. We need to keep that in mind as we talk about abiding and bearing fruit. There is no branch, there is no believer who is genuinely in the vine, who has genuinely received and rests on Jesus alone for salvation, who does not bear fruit. These are the very branches that are then subject to pruning by the Father, who is the gardener. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. I am not a gardener. I have two very non-green thumbs, but I know that pruning results in healthier plants and more abundant fruit. But... This pruning that Jesus speaks of is often quite painful and can leave us very confused about what's happening. Hebrews 12:11 says, "For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it." God does this pruning because he loves us immensely. Pruning is a cutting away that then results in us bearing more fruit. The thing pruned can be almost anything, an attitude, a job, a habit, a possession, the list goes on. I I think that often we do not see the thing that is pruned away as having been a problem, either at the time that it's pruned or sometimes for a very long time after that, maybe if ever. But that pruning, that discipline does result in us bearing more and better fruit. It is a loving act of a loving God in our lives. Jesus reassures his disciples at this point, already you were clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So the word clean is, uh, translated clean, is from the same word translated prune. They are already a pruned branch in the true vine. And he goes on to say, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I, am in, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. They're sitting there facing his physical departure from them and are feeling bereft. He is impressing on them their intimate and ongoing connection with him now and always. So we have two words to look at here, abiding and fruit. He tells us clearly we can do nothing without him, apart from him. We abide in the vine, we abide in Jesus, which results in us bearing fruit. The Greek word for abide is translated in other translations or even elsewhere in the ESV as remain, stay, dwell, continue, even endure. In the Message Bible, Peterson paraphrases verse 4 like this, live in me 
Make your home in me just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but but only by being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you're joined with me. So imagine if a home was provided for you. You've been welcomed, you've been handed the key. You don't just stay standing on the front porch. You go in, you live in the home. In these final hours together, Jesus is urging his disciples to remain faithful and reassuring them that their relationship with him continues. In verse 9, he says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. There's at least two really important points there. First of all, how has the Father loved the Son? Eternally from before the beginning of time. That's how we are loved by Jesus. From before forever. Second, it introduces love into this discussion of abiding. So so what is the fruit that we're talking about here? The fruit we bear is love. Verse 10 says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So this adds obedience into the mix. Abiding is the obedience. The fruit we bear is loving one another. The fruit we bear is any act of obedience that is characterized by Christ's love. At first glance, it kind of sounds like that's all about us and our ability or our strength to do that. That Abiding leads to fruit, but the reverse is not true. Bearing fruit does not lead to to abiding. We can't do it. It is not about earning. It is not about deserving. He is not talking about a conditional relationship with his disciples. He is not talking about a conditional relationship with us. Verse 5 already told us, apart from me, you can do nothing. The disciples can't do it. Israel proved that over and over. I prove that every day. Each of us proves that over and over as well. Abiding, obeying, is not solely dependent on our strength to make it happen any more than the branch can make itself grow on the vine. So remember the saving graces of faith and repentance that we talked about that are granted to us by the Holy Spirit? In uh, Tuesdays Together, the Women's Discipleship Group, we're talking about the uh, communicable attributes of God, those things that are true of God that he calls us to live out as well. Jen Wilkin, the author of the book we're currently using, said that as recipients of grace, we are both capable of obedience and commanded to obedience. So just as with faith and repentance, we do have a responsibility. Abiding is resting, but it is not passive. We have the responsibility to obey, but we do not do that alone. In telling the disciples this, Jesus has already promised that he will send a helper, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity who dwells with us as believers. Again, that same author reminds us that the Holy Spirit is both a lavish gift and a gracious gift giver. Love is the fruit born of obedience. So again, Remember what this evening is like for the disciples. The atmosphere, the heaviness, the magnitude of this time with Jesus. Jesus tells his disciples, tells us, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Joy. Joy in the midst of this confusing evening with its increasing sadness and fear. All that he has said that evening is so that his joy may be in them and in us. The joy of the fulfillment of the law, the joy of abiding, the joy of obedience. 
He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So what does it mean to love? As you may know, there are several words in the Greek language for love. In all these verses, the word agape is used. This love is not primarily an emotion, but rather it is a, it is a commitment that transcends our feelings in the moment. This feels kind of similar to when I spoke uh, previously from Philemon. So whereas in our culture, we often, if not usually, define love based on emotion and especially on our own need, and then therefore we make, we make it a transactional meaning or a love based on what I can get out of it. This kind of love is about the other person. As we see in the example of Jesus, it is a sacrificial love that seeks the good or the welfare of the other person. When I love in this way, my focus is your welfare over mine. When you love me in this way, your focus is my welfare over yours. It is characterized by a lack of self-interest. Now, I'm not talking about a love that invites abuse, puts us in the path of abuse, that makes us stay in a dangerous situation. I'm not talking about that. Agape love is, is love that looks beyond what is lovable. This love is active, it is a command. This love is not easy. Frankly, the, the moment we think this kind of love is easy, we have cheapened it, we have turned it into something completely different altogether. The only way we obey by loving like this is to love like the Father loves the Son and the Son loves us, and we cannot do this either, without the Holy Spirit. 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loves us. We don't do this without him, without the help of the Holy Spirit. But what are we saying if we refuse to love our brother or sister in this way? Can you abide in Christ and hate your brother and sister? What are we saying if we don't? Why do we have to love one another in this way? Well, first of all, we have to love each other like this because we have commanded by Jesus Christ to do so. That's obvious. We cannot get away from that. But if I will not love my brother or sister in Christ, then I think I must also be calling Jesus either a fool or a liar. Since I'm then saying I don't have to love the same people that Christ has loved since before forever and was willing to lay his life down for. 1 John 4.20 says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So if I hate my brother or sister, then I also hate God. This obedience, though, is not born of a sense of obligation or fear or a need to earn our place in the vine. So if we find ourselves saying or thinking, 
oh, well, I should do such and such. I ought to love so and so. Somehow, particularly in an attempt to somehow cause Jesus to love us more or to make our position with him more secure, then that's a huge red flag that something is very wrong. We may be the branch, at least, may be the branch trying to go it alone without the vine. So when thinking of this, uh, an, an analogy popped into my head. Um, several years ago, the alternator in my car died. It happened after I returned to the airport here, after going to a conference. It was way after dark. The car started up okay, but as I drove home, the lights on the dashboard got dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. I turned off all the electrical things that I could and prayed I would make it home. Fortunately, the last gasp of the engine occurred as I coasted into the end of my driveway. If the alternator goes out, the battery quickly fails. But you don't ask the battery to just try harder. The alternator is what supplies the battery with power. We have a responsibility to love, just as we do in coming to faith and repentance, but we do not and cannot do that alone. Jesus calls his disciples friends. In the Old Testament, only Abraham and Moses are called friends of God. And once again, much like we talked about in verse 10, verse 14 does not say that their obedience is what makes them friends. It is what characterizes his friends. This friendship does carry responsibility. As his friends, Jesus has made known to us all they need. They have been chosen by him to go and bear fruit. Same for us. We have been chosen. We are fully equipped. We have the Holy Spirit, the helper. He has given us everything to enable us to abide and bear fruit. He has given us everything we need to obey by loving one another. So I like to beat a metaphor to death. So what has the branch have to what does the branch have to do as part of the vine? It has to draw water and nutrients provided by the vine. If the branch was detached from the vine, it would no longer be able to draw what it needs to produce any fruit any more than the battery can charge itself after the alternator goes bad. If we try to go it alone, we will fail just like Israel before us. So where we see a need, a lack, a lack of fruit, a grudging obedience, a failure to love our brothers and sisters, we must go to Jesus and not just try harder. Going to Jesus is an action. If we do not see spiritual fruit, if we find ourselves not loving our brothers and sisters, if we habitually want to go our own way and refuse to obey, we must go to Jesus. We must go to the vine. As Mike frequently says, we must run to Jesus. What does that look like? It is not just adding spiritual things to our to-do list in order just to cross them off the list. Verses 7 and 16 both give us a clue about when, what running to Jesus looks like. For example, in verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This does not mean that this is some kind of divine vending machine, by the way. It is seeking help from the Holy Spirit. It is prayer. It is spending time reading or listening to his word, but not in some kind of formulaic, you know, brush your teeth for two minutes or chew each bite 20 times sort of way, but in a way to hear and understand and absorb and be immersed in his message to us. It is acknowledging the grace of God in our lives. It is observing the Sabbath. It is being grateful to him 
in a very mindful sort of way. I am all about the to-do lists in my life. I get all kind of flack because of my big giant paper planner. I will even add stuff that I have just completed to my to-do list, so I have the immense pleasure of crossing them off. But I am not saying add these things to an already full to-do list just to be able to check them off. I am saying make these a part of your life. Build these things into your schedule as Jesus' friend, as the branch abiding in the vine. I am learning a lot recently in my new phase of life with work and such. There is a huge difference between putting stuff on your to-do list and actually putting it on your schedule. So abiding is the obedience, and the fruit born is love. Jesus commands it of us, the Holy Spirit enables us to do it, and we have the responsibility to live it. So Jesus ends the end of this section of the, his discourse with these words. These things I command you so that you will love one another. This is at least the third time he has said that to his disciples this night. He presses the point home. We know we will not do this perfectly or consistently. We will hurt each other sometimes. The disciples did too. But we will, it, we will not let it end there. The Holy Spirit does not let it end there. We see in all of the words here that Jesus was reassuring the disciples of their very intimate connection as the branch intimately connected to the vine, assuring them of his love. He assures us of his love in which we abide, which enables us to obey, to love one another. Father, I ask you that you impress upon us the same message that the disciples heard that, that, that very monumental night. That we are to love one another. You have given us all that we need, including your Holy Spirit. Lord, that is in many ways some too much to even absorb. Lord, help us to each day recognize you have chosen us. You have chosen us to bear fruit. You have chosen us to love one another. Lord, help us to do that each day. And in your son's very precious name, amen.